Kisi Lai. Uh, please meet Rinani Gadio, my partner. Rinani, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hi, Sneha, and hi, everyone. A very warm welcome. Uh, we're very excited to have another insightful, informative session today. Thanks, Rinani. Uh, so Rinani is an architect uh, by training. Uh, she has practiced architect architecture and lighting design. Uh, and she's also taught at university uh, where she's researched historical narratives. Uh, she was also the founding editor of Wondo Arc and Stir. Her curiosities now lie in questioning normative mechanisms in the creative community, usually through written and curatorial practices. Um, about me, a little bit about me. Um, uh, I'm a journalist uh, by education. Uh, I'm an educator and curator of storytelling experiences. Uh, I've previously worked with brands like Jaipur Rugs, Kodesh Properties, El Decor, Exchange for Media. Uh, currently, my focus lies in brand and marketing communications and curating experiences for all kinds of end users. Uh, I enjoy working with design, luxury, retail, real estate, fintech, and social impact brands. So for me, architecture and design is, is just, I, I'm, I'm learning something new every day, especially through the sessions that we create for you. All right, a um, little bit about what the season is about. Uh, we, we are calling it Smarter Living. This is, um, uh, we're, uh, we're kind of looking at how we are defining smarter living in today's day and context. Uh, but for us, when we define smarter living, it extends beyond tech integration and innovation. Uh, we wanted each session to focus on efficiency, sustenance, long-term use and effects not just on us, but also on the natural built environment as a whole. So with this season, we hope to have experts share how they plan to bring the focus back on and be tuned in more to evolving human needs and also, of course, through meaningful, effective design. But before we begin this masterclass, we have a uh, special guest with us today. Uh, we have Sham Otwani. Um, hi, Sham. If you can hi. See. Hi, Sneha. Hi, Sham. I'm not I'm sure if you can see your video just as yet. If you can turn on your video, please. Great. Yes, hi, Sham. Good to hi. have you. So Sham is the EVP and business head of Godrej Locks and Architecture for Thinking Systems. Uh, it's a business division of uh, Godrej and Boys Manufacturing um, Co, Co Limited. Uh, over the past three decades, he has spearheaded many important roads with the group. Under his leadership, currently at Godrej Locks, uh, he, um, uh, the division has built an extraordinary portfolio and shown impressive financial performance, which has been validated through various uh, awards, such as prestigious, the prestigious uh, CII Business Excellence Award for the year 2014. Uh, Sham, thank you so much for having uh, for, for being here today with us. Um, thank so you. Today, as you know, the, the, the session is going to be about transformative spaces. So I thought you could help us, um, you know, maybe uh, from your perspective as a business head of a, um, uh, of a architectural fittings business, what does a transformative space mean to you? How would you define that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the very word transform actually means trying to uh, make a, a given, maybe an object or a space or a skill uh, deliver on uh, the needs and expectations of the, you know, of the, of the, of the customers or of, uh, you know, if you talk about space, how do you really deliver on those needs and expectations? How do you really try and use uh, space in a very flexible manner? How do you make it adaptable? How do you make it more versatile? So all that actually is, um, you know, transforming uh, what you have into something that you want to really make uh, deliver on, 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 on needs and expectations of people who you know, live in those spaces or who occupy those spaces. So in the context of, I think, architecture and the stuff that we are doing, I think we are trying to, uh, I mean, if I was to take an example of a smart kitchen, yeah. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the work that we've done uh, for smart kitchens, it's all about uh, really understanding the uh, Indian kitchen needs and expectations or the user's needs and expectations and understanding what really is going to help in delivering on various aspects of the transformation we spoke about in terms of making it far more efficient, uh, far more um, you know, productive, uh, also from the point of view of uh, ergonomics, uh, 
how do you make sure that it comes with the least of uh, the you know the stress and the strain that you experience while you're operating in your kitchen space and how do you really uh, you know make the best use of the space in terms of utilization of the given you know space that you have so i think there are some very smart uh, designs and products that we can really think of in ensuring that you have some smart kitchens transformed into uh, things that can really be unimaginable uh, at times so i think that's what i mean by transformation by and large making it largely i would think at the end of the day apart from many other things how do you really deploy technology and the skill of design to make it visually very appealing and desirable that's always a challenge too right where you're yeah. thinking about the amalgamation amalgamation of technology uh without having to um compromise on any kind of technique or any kind of craft uh Correct. which is interesting because um you know i remember back in march um you know you you were the one who took took us and a contingent of architects and designers um um uh, you know uh, through the factory uh, at, at your plant in goa where um, it was so interesting to see the arsenal of uh, women uh, artisans specifically as well as many other uh, people who are um, you know using their hands to work on certain aspects of the lock um you know and of course different kinds of locks in different ways right Correct. so it was so interesting to see that you know that that you 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 are actually doing that as a business you are trying to amalgamate technology with um with the art of hand making so i wanted to talk, i wanted you to just highlight uh, on that right why is it important for you as a business to not forego the art of hand making you see i think uh, at the end of the day uh, you know you have to make sure that you uh, use the uh, required skills of craftsmanship uh, right. because you know it is at the end of the day an art uh, that you hone over a period of time through practice and uh, you know if uh, if you look at uh, you know the uh, specific uh, art of uh, you know handmade or handcrafted techniques that you use you're largely uh, you know looking at the challenges of how do you therefore design for manufacturability right how do you therefore design for uh, you know unparalleled functionality that you want to deliver sure uh, how yeah. do you how do you design for uh, you know very high perceived quality that uh, you know consumers generally want to Uh, assess the value and pay uh, for that value and finally how do you actually uh, design more importantly when it comes to uh, end users how do you design for ease of use um and also uh, you know when it comes to actual um, you know implementation installation how do you design for ease of installation so That's all true. of that has to be kept in mind and therefore uh, a lot of this has to be uh born in mind uh, and the art of hand making and hand crafting and all of that gets into into play right uh, you know as far as this uh, whole business of the craft of you know uh, transforming spaces is concerned so you know i think design plays a very important role in 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 so far as uh, you know making things which can help us integrate modern technology with materials Yeah. With, with various sciences that you have, uh, natural uh, stuff that you can use, and all of that, and bringing all of that together, and at the end of the day, as you rightly mentioned, how do you really design? Um, you know, as far as um, conscious, uh, you know, concepts of sustainability and uh, environment friendliness are concerned. Yeah. All of that, I think, comes into play. I mean, it's a very complex thing. and you're doing so many things which actually you know interplay with each other that's true yeah for sure uh, and also of course meet the meet the demand meet the supply uh, requirements of from a large scale perspective Absolutely. right in terms Absolutely. of customer um yeah just lastly if you want to just share with us are there any specific uh, product design or um, you know or uh, interior design trends that have piqued your interest uh especially in terms of um transformative uh, spaces or in terms of uh, you know crafting custom customizable spaces yeah i think uh, like i mentioned uh, uh there is a lot of uh, you know concern that we have now for uh, the kind of processes we use uh, right. in so far as uh, 
you know ultimately uh, delivering some of the designs that we come up with uh, which which actually not just help us to design to cost uh, mm -hmm. and also which are uh, from the manufacturability angle you know easy to convert but i think the challenge lies in uh, how uh, uh, what kind of uh, processes you are deploying to make sure that you have um, you know at the end of the day guaranteed um, you know recyclability uh, biodegradability uh, you know the, right. uh, the 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 chemical processes that you use for finishing yeah uh, i mean uh, at the end of the day uh, uh, the the finish of what you make is extremely important and finishes require uh, a lot of effort uh, in when when it comes to sustainability in making your chemistry very very you know eco friendly so what kind of chemicals you use uh, how how effectively are you able to recycle stuff that you're using in your factories so all of that i think uh, i think the 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 designs that architects are supposed to be really now uh, really making and uh, you know using have to keep all of this in mind and i'm always you know uh, at the end of the day i'm always concerned about um, uh, how are we making sure that our consumers are at the end of the day going to be benefiting uh, and the generations thereafter are going to be benefiting from all the work that has gone into design and manufacturing or um, you know crafting uh, things that are ultimately highly sustainable right. uh, and which can continue to leverage mother nature uh, in a manner that uh, doesn't lead to depletion of the uh, finite resources but actually uh, you know adding more to the nature and making sure that the nature which is abound with many things that we can really use in our design and our manufacturing are uh, you know put to uh, the best possible effect when it comes to products and you know spaces and other things that consumers want to pay for right right no i think that that completely makes sense and it's and it's so interesting to see that um, you know you're sharing this because um, you know, very few businesses, uh, I mean, of course, there is a mandate, you know, in terms of UN SDGs and in terms of, you know, really thinking about how you're making a larger impact on the environment and on support communities. So it's really great to hear that, you know, you're, you as a business are making a conscious effort to keep in mind about the larger impact that you're trying to make in terms of chemicals, in terms of, uh, you know, ease of process, and also in terms of supporting a community that, um, you know, has been providing and, is, and has been instrumental in, uh, you know, making your, developing your products. Um, so that's great um, uh, insight uh, for us, uh, Sham, to, to actually you. kick off our masterclass today. Thank you so much for sharing, for sharing that with us. And, uh, and yeah, please um, uh, stay on uh, and uh, maybe you'll have more insights to share, uh, you know, post Sarika's masterclass. Certainly, my pleasure. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Sham. Thank you. All right. On on that note, um, uh, it's it's time. Uh, let me just uh, do a quick introduction about um, you know why are we here to talk about uh, uh, crafting transformative spaces today. So I was reading up somewhere, um, and this this uh, particular statement really stood out for me. Craft is a manifestation of the physical realm of design, using both theory and skill. But how does that manifest in in today's day and age when we consider building spaces and when we, when we consider designing spaces. Uh, craft, as we all know, has been intrinsic, especially in Indian culture and especially in Indian design and architecture. And sometimes, I mean, um, we do take that for granted. We often do take that for granted. Craft is also often in reference to small scale industries and handmade processes. Um, however, more so now than ever before, it's being reimagined, reinterpreted in contemporary forms, in contemporary styles and techniques. Uh, a lot of regional narratives, indigenous uh, materials and local skills are being explored, are being experimented on in exciting ways. So we're so excited to have Sarika Shetty join us. Hi, Sarika. So she is going to be addressing the subject of crafting transformative spaces. Um, she will be talking about how craft satisfies the human need to create what its origins are in architecture, how craft manifests in unique perspectives, and a lot more. Um, so Sarika, hi, thank you so much for joining us. Um, for those who uh, 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 are meeting Sarika for the first time, I would love to uh, share a little bit about her. 
So Sarika is a partner at SGK Architects, along with Shumur Kadri and Vaishali uh, Mangal Vedekar and Roshni Shilsagar. Founded in 1990s, SJK Architects is a Bombay-based, uh, Mumbai-based collective of 30-plus built environment professionals, working with clients, collaborators across India. Um, she has 20 years of experience. Um, her work uh, cuts across multiple scales and building typologies, some of which she's going to share with us today. Uh, and of course, working with a lot of diverse sites and clientele. She's passionate about cultural history. She believes in an architectural uh, practice of contemporary Indians guided by the past, which I think, which I think makes her the ideal candidate for today's masterclass. Uh, over the years, of course, she has led several award-winning projects uh, at SJK, um, setting benchmarks and context-driven sustainable design in the country across the globe. For instance, there is a Dasavatra um, hotel in Tirupati, the boat club apartments, and more recently, a 100-bed rural multi-specialty uh, hospital in Alibag, designed to create an environment of calm and healing. Uh, Sarika's quest for learning and exploring also translates into her love for the wilderness and bird watching. When away from work, she can be found trekking and exploring the jungle with her teenage daughter. Uh, and just FYI, she was also one of our jury members at this year's GVs, uh, which just concluded a few months ago. Um, Sarika, again, thank you so much for your time. Um, the stage is yours. Thank you, Sneha. Thank you, Mrilali. Thank you, GVCC. Oh, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, should we get started, Sneha? Yes, you can go ahead, Sarika. You can you can share your screen and yeah. You can Just give me a second. Thank you for having me on this. Uh, so what I'm going to speak about is uh, really crafting transformative spaces. Um, and what better way to learn than nature? Um, so this is really what you know the bees are uh, doing in terms of creating the honeycomb. Uh, such a balanced hexagonal structure, which is completely devoid of any negatives and uh, multipurpose in terms of its usage. Uh, the balance of geometry is great. Uh, what you see, these cells are not just for storing honey, but it's also for raising their babies. Um, and it's such a diverse and versatile form that actually we as human beings um, use in various different formats. So I'm starting with nature because I'm quite a nature evangelist and that's where I'd like to start this with. Um, so what is craft really and where does craft really kind of play a role in architecture? It's I think any craft is really um, an absolute amalgamation of how the mind works and how the hand works. Uh, now the technique can be as handcrafted as possible or it could be technology driven and how materials can be molded to really bring this all together. Uh, my next example would be simply how uh, the absolute balanced interlacing of the warp and the weft in the weaving technology. Uh, this is a very simple plain weave, uh, but then how you put together various different numbers of warps and wefts together can create patterns, can create textures, and uh, various different aspects can give you a different outcome. And that's what any crafted uh, um, product is all about. You know, it's about the permutations that you can work with and there's an interpretation to every single aspect that can take it to another level. Um, and we're breaking this masterclass into roughly about five sections and trying to uh, 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 deeply go into a few of these which are pretty close to us as a practice. And uh, one of the things that we do in the office is that uh, writers who are, uh, you know, some of our architects are writers um, and uh, we do something called the block doing exercise. And this is from one of the blogs that one of our ex-teammates uh, created uh, called Shamika. And she had written about craft and I'm picking up four aspects from that blog to really talk about more in terms of deeply going into our work. Um, the first one that I'm going to do through example of our own project is how we create and we co-create. 
And in the process, how the collaboration really gives us um, very different uh, options, especially how do you think out of the box as a collective to give you this. Uh, this first project is a building in Bangalore. It's uh, an office building for a film production house called Nirvana Films. Um, a film production company does that does absolutely cutting edge movies and films. Um, the first brief that we got for a project uh, for this project was uh, uh, so again the story goes like this that you know this client came to us after having seen a project of ours in Al Sur in Bangalore. Uh, a Yamini showroom that we had done in a, a typical bungalow, which kind of lines up the lakefront of Al Sur. And we transformed that into a space for home furnishings. They entered that space, and I think the magic of light that they realized in the space was something that completely stayed with them. And the first mail that we got from them was literally what the brief for their uh, office building would be like. Um, what it said was literally what you see on the screen, highly structured. They wanted it to be an environment that is absolutely relaxing. Uh, street, clean lines, no fuss. Um, they do, as filmmakers, understand the um, aspect of detailing and they know how hard it is to get detailing right. And that's what they really strive for in a project like this. Uh, easy to maintain and they shouldn't be tiring out of that space and they should be able to grow with the space and hence uh, the design needs to do that. It's a small corner plot, typical of Bangalore. You have these uh, 60 by 40 feet plots, which are roughly about 2,400 square feet. We were fortunate to have this as a corner plot with the west and the south open, beautiful Nirva, uh, uh, Indranagar Park on one side, while the road on the other side. It is a residential area where this corner plot has this little office building. And that's the skyline that you see across literally G plus two, G plus three structures. We had our bylaws to kind of uh, work our math out with. And what we got was a corner plot that after all our bylaws were met with, we got a uh, footprint which was about 12 by 15 and a height restriction about 11 meters. The reason I'm going into these details are to also look at, you know, how the needs of a building actually starts um, the constraints of the site also starts becoming the opportunities that you actually take up and turn that around. So we've got a site which has the south and the west open, but the north and the east completely shut. Uh, while the north was the best light that we could have afforded, uh, given that southwest are the monsoons, we have these beautiful two uh, large trees right in the corner, and we actually made use of that. And the way this building works is we cut across the building created a spine right in the center, created the vertical communication through the staircase right in the center, and the courtyard and the light well became the staircase. So in a physical sense, you can't have a courtyard in such a tight scenario. So what do you do? You do uh, what you can, which is use your vertical communication, which is the staircase and the courtyard to intermingle with each other and create a space that actually is suffused with light. Uh, so that's basically how the building is split. It's a tight building, which is about 12 by 15. And given that it's Bangalore, which has a beautiful weather, of course, climate change is uh, uh, changing things. Um, but uh, what we did this uh, building 10 years ago was with no air conditioning at all. There's only an editing and a tape room, which is air conditioned. No other spaces are air conditioned. So what I'm going to touch upon for this building is how we worked with the facade of this building and the facade became actually the breathing skin of the building. So that's the spine that you see where the staircase is cutting across. It connects you to across the floors and becomes the uh, core or the lit space where people come back to interact. That's the way the staircase kind of cuts across. It weaves around a central uh, retaining wall and kind of takes you from one space to the other. Now, what I'm going to touch upon is how the facade really worked. Uh, functionally, what this building has is at the ground floor, it is a completely stilted space. A lot of auditions happen. So people are kind of waiting at the lower floor uh, while they're being called in for the auditions. The first floor is completely admin accounts, audition spaces. The second floor is the whole production unit where the entire design team and the thought leadership happens. 
Um, and the top floor is really the director and the producer space with a lot of breakout spaces in between, inclusive of the edit and tape and the home theater uh, room. Now, what this building needed to do was we worked with the idea of the skin and a skin where we literally inversed the idea of the wall and the idea of the opening. Uh, what this building did was the wall became the clear glass while the openings became the white surface. Uh, so in any project, while you reach this kind of a, what you're seeing right now is very synthesized and very articulated, but to reach that kind of a thought is also an aspect of how you're crafting your thoughts and synthesizing them to restrain them in a manner that you get the needs for the building completely fulfilled from functionality point of view and efficiency point of view. Uh, what we did was we would wanted to explore a material that was never used before. Uh, and that was not the starting point. We actually started with mock-ups where we used a wooden shutter and realized that wood was not the language that we wanted to use uh, in this building. And what we used was, what you see on the right is a mock-up that was done with a, a solid acrylic surface, which in the layman's language, one knows it as DuPont's Korean, which was used only on kitchen countertops at that time. We did not have the budgets to use even DuPont Korean, and hence we started looking at the market to really see which are the other materials of the same composition and chemical uh, um, uh, composition that we could use. And we used something called tristone as a material. It's a solid acrylic surface. It's completely recyclable. And what we did is we created a system of louvered shutters uh, by making them really lightweight. Uh, it has an aluminum framework on the inside. The reason to use white was so that the building starts casting beautiful shadows on the surface. The surface was used faceted so that it creates a pattern on the facade. And the reason to use it louvered is so that you could modulate your wind, you could modulate your light, you could modulate your rain uh, based on the uh, intensity at which rain falls, because this is completely non-air conditioned and it is completely cross-ventilated. I'm just going to go quickly through the journey of this, because this was a collaboration with many, uh, many different units who have never done this before. The unit who actually was identified to do this had only done kitchen countertops in the past. Um, so it was very interesting that when human beings um, actually start taking a challenge and start bringing their passion into it, how can many different heads and minds come together to create something which was never done before? Um, so this was the nuance in terms of how one shutter got produced here in Worli at a workshop in Bombay. Uh, the site is in Bangalore. Uh, we had to uh, make sure that every single aspect of hardware that goes into these shutters were pre-planned. Every single shutter was just about 60 kgs and nothing about that because the mechanics of the entire shutters that work together would haven't functioned had it been anything more than that. Uh, we went to the extent of actually creating the entire hardware. You see this one single handle that holds it. Uh, it actually works as a single handle come rail. You can modulate it at various different degrees so that you can get an angle of 15, 30, 60, 90, depending on the way you want to bring in wind, light, and not rains. Uh, so all these were little, little, little crafted details that we actually worked with by only sketching, mocking, trying. We failed at times, but at times we kind of had the cooperation of all these um, people who made it possible. So what you see at the end of it is a facade that breathes, a facade that is very dynamic, uh, completely versatile, uh, plays with the light and the shadow, allows for the amount of light that you want to bring in and the wind that you want to bring in. And you can see how it works across spaces. So this is uh, the producer's room on the top floor. Uh, you can see how that railing kind of holds it together and functions as the handle as well. Uh, you, the idea of the wall and the um, window being reversed is what I meant over here, where the walls became the fixed glass, while the window became the white shutters. That's the director's room. 
each space almost afforded you know two sides and that's beautifully cross ventilating the space this is the production floor where you see it completely enjoying the mahogany tree outside uh, and on the reverse what we did on the inside was uh, uh, the structure kind of cocooned to form this very uh, uh, definite spine because space was a constraint and a lot of spaces opened up to the corners and these these this building doesn't have conference rooms that are closed it doesn't have dining spaces that are closed and that was the kind of uh, uh, challenge the client was able to take and was willing to take and it was great to see that how spaces are used across this building that's the spine that you see at the uh, um, at the far end of the image that you see, that's the entrance side where the spine kind of cuts through, that the south uh, that you enter through, and the back side is the north. And what I'm going to get into is the second element of how on the north side you have another element, which is a jali. And this is again a very highly crafted item. And what we had was the neighbor absolutely peering into this space. But we wanted our winds because our winds were not south. And that was completely important for us to do. So what we did was we created these tall 20 feet uh, elements of lures. Um, we believe in the power of model making, actually trying and testing them before you actually mock them up on site. And these are uh, old BTC recycled wood as wide as six inches, as tall as 20 feet each element. And they are punctuated with just acrylic so that they are all interrebated and you don't have if it's shut, the rains will never come in. If it's shut, you'll have uh, no noise, but at other times it's completely kept open so that you have the winds flowing through. Some of the details of how each one of these were worked out. All of this just takes a lot of intensive working with the craftsmen, with the teams, a lot of mock-ups. They don't happen in the first go. The first time we would have imagined that the punctuations would be in glass and realize that the weight becomes too high. And again, this is also all interconnected, functions together and opens together. So that's how you see these spaces and you see how this element is kind of breathing through the building in various different forms. That's the spine that cuts through. Again, you see the interaction between the rooms and the spine over here. And I'm just going to put one minute. Before. We mostly sleep. I take a break, we eat a lot, I try to walk the dogs, but you just can't blame us, our office is such. We're here to work and sometimes we do, we play FIFA or race a car, but you just can't blame us, our office is such. Our days start at 12 and nights never end With the wind so soothing and the place so pleasing You just can't blame us, our office is such We are Nirvana Films and we love our new office Pure production bliss, now in a new outfit So that's really what the space uh, did finally for its occupants. And uh, it's about 11 years they're occupying the space and very happy to uh, not outgrow out of it. And I think they've maintained it really well. So again, another aspect of stewardship, which comes and plays a very important role in these buildings are how they get maintained at the end. You know, we as architects build them and leave, uh, but how do they live their lives is so important. And hence craftsmanship in terms of how detailing gets done and executed is the only way you can maintain it uh, for a lifetime or uh, keep its beauty alive. Uh, the second uh, chapter that I'm going to go into is uh, how craftsmanship in architecture also originates from two different viewpoints. One is the context and the culture. This is a project in Tirupati, which is a four-star or five-star hotel that we did in 2015, uh, deeply rooted in the religious context of Tirupati. Uh, and what we did over here is I'm only going to talk about one aspect of this project, which is uh, the central pavilion that you see. It's called the All Day Dining and the Lotus Cafe. 
Um, the project was inspired completely by the Tirumala Tirupati Temple Complex and its planning. Um, the highly introverted orthogonal and the circumambulatory aspects of the planning and how that got converted into um, what we needed as our needs for a function and a program of a hotel of this nature. Um, we, to the north had the reserve forest, to the south was the entry point for the building. To the east over here was an existing water park that created a lot of noise. And to the west and beyond on the south was a ever growing urban fabric, which one did not have a control on on how it would grow. And hence the design had to create its own um, internalizing of a visual that can be enjoyed by all. So what we did was inspired by the uh, temple planning, we completely refined and distilled it into a contemporary uh, idiom that fulfills all the guest needs and distinguishes completely the operational needs through efficient planning. And that's super critical when it comes to hospitality because guest movements and staff movements are the most important uh, aspects of it. So I'm going to only focus on the Lotus Cafe. This is basically how the plan sits. It's on a tight three and a half acre plot, a 120 key um, kind of, you can say a city hotel. And uh, uh, the project is completely inspired and uh, has interpreted the 10 avatars of Vishnu um, and associated with space planning in terms of both its emotive uh, nature and its formative nature. Um, that's the way the building sits in its context. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Lotus Cafe, which is inspired by the fifth avatar of Vishnu, which is Narsimha. And uh, Narsimha as the fifth avatar was at the threshold of, you know, neither being the man nor the beast, neither the day nor the night, was at the threshold. And what we interpreted it as was being at the threshold, uh, being neither on the land nor on the water and being neither at the day or the cusp of day and night, which is basically the twilight. Um, Lotus as a form is something that you see all across Tirupati. It's something which is the symbol that pervades through all avatars of Vishnu. And uh, that was the formative nature that we were deriving for this all day dining space, uh, which was right in the center, like a pushkarni, which is like a mandapa in the middle of water. And our interpretation of the temple to the hotel was basically the difference was that in a temple, you have a garbagriha that you circumambulate around. Uh, with the space planning and the operations of a hotel, what we did was actually made the courtyard into a water body and uh, um, took a celebratory aspect of how an all-day dining space could be sitting in the middle of the water like the lotus does in water. Uh, what the program needed to fulfill was this was the all-day dining space. Uh, it's important to know that uh, when architecture is form-based, it's basically derives out of a function, derives out of a program and the numbers that it has to fulfill. Uh, so this is a space which is roughly about 14 meters by 14 meters, can fit in about 100 packs on the inside and roughly about uh, 30 packs on the outside. So that makes it roughly 130 people that can be seated here at any given time. Um, the formative nature of the space completely uh, connect to all the other spaces in the uh, hotel. So that was basically how our interpretation of the lotus as a form was converted into something which was absolutely symmetric, uh, geometric, and something which was highly crafted. Uh, now, creation of such a structure was pretty challenging because we did not want to build it as a uh, um, we wanted to build it as a very light structure. So it actually uses steel in the structural framework. Sorry, I'll have to get out of this to move into the next slide. Yeah, so, um, you know, a dining space in a hotel, which is uh, air-conditioned, fire speakers, 
uh, LB, everything that has to go in comes with its own complexities in terms of how the structure needs to build. So there is an outer skin, which is this highly tessellated structure. And then there is a double tessellated inner skin in between which all the services run. Um, what also happens is these are the kind of drawings we end up producing also so that the site team, not everybody is highly uh, um, educated on that side to be able to read your drawing. So when you're making these kind of drawings, it just becomes absolutely easy for the team there who's going to use their uh, skills to translate this and transform this. It makes it easy for them to understand. Uh, what I'm going to run through is the making of the Lotus Cafe very quickly. It's a steel structure. The there are roughly about 16 columns which are in the V shape and it starts getting the steel beams in this profile, the steel rafters and the skin starts getting formed. It's sitting in the midst of the water body. The building is otherwise a very simple RCC structure except for this being a lightweight steel structure. Uh, we've used uh, simple GI corrugated shuttering so that that can be used and left there as the shuttering not to be deshuttered. Um, our uh, skin, what you see on the top is just about a 50 mm thick screed concrete, something like the way you do ferrocreting. Uh, Mock-ups play a very important role for us to understand how this works, whether the team has understood it well, whether they'll be able to give us the finishes, because everything that you see here, what you see raw is what you end up getting. There is no cladding, there is no addition of uh, thicknesses that will make it appear finished. What you cast is what you get as the finish. The mock-ups done, we realize that the heat of Tirupati doesn't allow you to do 50 mm thick screed concrete in the middle of the day. So everything had to be done in the night between 12 to 4. Uh, these are all learnings and these are all things that the team on site collaborates to really realize what the sequencing of action should be. You see the corrugated sheets coming up and forming the tessellated roof. Now the Screed concrete is continuing. That's the scale of the cafe that you see. You can see how people are working on top of it. The corrugated sheets also help in terms of the bonding and the reinforce that you need uh, in, a, in an otherwise non-reinforced 50 mm thick screed concrete. You see the roof is kind of done and you see the blemishes of what the mock-ups and the uh, you know the processes ended up doing, which needs to be now kind of completely camouflaged. On the inside, while the entire structure is kind of being suspended to take all the services inside, uh, and the second skin starts coming in to play with how the facade needs to work, how all the other finishes needs to work. And on the top, we basically have to protect this entire thing with a waterproofing layer that completely makes it seamless on the top. And on the top where the three men are sitting, that's a flat portion so that a finial comes on top so that it's the remembrance of how a mandapa with a gopura happens in a temple. Um, that's the final finishing with the waterproofing and that's the final pictures of how the Lotus Cafe sits in the final context of the building. Few more pictures of how the Lotus Cafe sits in with the cafe, uh, with the water body on the right side is another specialty restaurant called the Thali restaurant, it serves Speciality thalis from all across the country. Uh, this is at the threshold between the thali and the water body, and you see the layering of how you can visualize the spaces from this point with the Lotus Cafe and the guest block behind it. This is the way you perceive it in the day, um, the correlation between the building and the Lotus Cafe. This is the way you perceive it in the night, and as the twilight starts setting in, the building starts kind of speaking a different language. It's a little beacon in the middle of uh, uh, um, this, this space, which has kind of grown now into an urban fabric, which is very dense. And what has helped in that entire bargain is that we were able to create our own introverted uh, visual connect through the water body, uh, while on the other side, we had the beautiful nature available to us. Uh, some more details of how the crafted aspects of each one of these works. So you saw how the challenge of the Lotus Cafe is a simple structure uh, converted into just the skill of how uh, metal welding, craft of metal making, connections, joineries, making it completely waterproof. Uh, all of that really plays an important role. At the same time, we were also using a lot of crafts from Andhra. Um, to uh, create all the other aspects. What you see here is the door into the Lotus Cafe that uses the 
craft of dokra, which is a lost wax uh, metal casting method. And these are live large scales. You know, dokra as a craft may not have been ever used in these kind of formats. Dokra is a very static format, which is kind of used in artworks or on walls. But here we were engineering it to become a handle. And when it becomes a handle, you are moving it, you're pulling it, you're pushing it. So the engineering of making sure that it gets fixed right, it gets bolted well, it doesn't loosen up, all that comes into play. So it's literally like product design happening there. Uh, same goes with the graphics and the signages for the space, what you see with, uh, um, with the uh, signage for the space. And uh, uh, since I'm not going across this project on the whole, just wanted to show you there's a storyboard of the narrative which actually says how the 10 avatars get uh, interpreted into spaces. And this is right in front of the Lotus Cafe entrance door so that, you know, the all day dining space where it's a bed and breakfast uh, uh, hotel, you will never miss this. So you get the correlation of all the other spaces that you walk into. Why are they the way they are? And uh, this is also, I'm bringing the aspect of how technology and craft plays an important role. Uh, in this, this could have been done in carving with the human hand, but what this does is this is a CNC uh, um, produced panel in, uh, in stone. And what we did was we gave drawings and sketches for various different depths on how this works. And then this was fed into the uh, CNC machine so that you could get this precision of uh, uh, the crafted nature of uh, the product. Um, so how, how in terms of even technology, where technology kind of helps in making things happen, because these sizes are not very large in terms of it, it's carved detailing. So you can see when it comes to the eyes, it comes to the chakra, to get that kind of a finesse, uh, handwork would have been far more kind of expensive, as well as these are not multiple numbers. Um, so how do you kind of get the finish and the finesse on this? The third one I'm going to run through very quickly again is how craft manifests itself to, you know, save energy, being highly climatic response, uh, uh, responsive, how it helps in breaking visual scales and creates a social impact. This is another hotel in Bodh Gaya, again, based on the religious tourism tenets for the same client. And while we worked with Vaishnavism and created a whole story and a narrative around the brand for uh, 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 Dashaftar, here this is on the tenets of Buddhism. It's in Bodh Gaya. We all know that's the land of the Buddha. And uh, uh, without getting into the project per se, what I'm going to only concentrate on here at the moment is how the scale of this entire building is, uh, so both guys has a very hot and dry climate. Uh, all the spaces that you see over here are again, uh, uh, access spaces that you see on either sides of this courtyard, which are completely uh, open and non-air conditioned. So insulation becomes a very, very important, uh, uh, plays an important role. This is a larger site at about four and a half acres. It is more of a resort property, roughly about 78 keys and largely widespread on this site. And all the roofscapes that you see uses something called the country tiles. And what we did was, and what, what you see internally is that these are vaulted structures inspired by the vaults that you see in the region, in the Mahabodhi temple, and in the context of, you know, everything right from Nalanda to the Sujata caves that you see and have in the context around that was the inspiration to actually use uh, the language of the tradition and contemporize it only to the level and the need that it actually functions back as a hotel of this nature. Um, you see a truss above this vaulted structure, and what you see is five to six layers of country tiles. Now, the reason to pick on this aspect was because social impact was such an important aspect of how you give back to the community here. Uh, these are detailing of how the half vault works, how the layering of the structure works. It's a vaulted RCC structure, which then has a uh, 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 metal skin on top of it, which allows you to then fix in the country tiles. Um, that's the detail of how each and every junction works and how the country tiles gets fitted. And to do this entire thing, what we did was we engaged with 12 villages, 26 families. Um, these are inherently potter families who are uh, uh, kind of producing pots 
Uh, country tiles is something that you see prevalent in many parts of the country, both in the North and the South, uh, but it's not very much used in today's day and context. Uh, what we got them to do is produce these thousands and lakhs of country tiles that was required to act as the insulating layer, and in turn created a lot of employment and social impact, and in turn created insulation and a climate responsive aspect to the project. Uh, that's how you see it right on the top. The spaces are absolutely well ventila uh, ventilated as well as insulated. Uh, I'm just going to play the video of this. Am I able to hear the sound? Um, no, I'm not able to hear it. You didn't hear it during Nirvana also? Yeah, I did then. Yeah, yeah, it is playing. There is a little bit of sound. Yeah. This will just give a gist of it. It'll tie back to how the hotel functions, looks, and reacts. Yeah. This beautiful play of light and shadow that keeps changing all through the day. Those are the little keyhole windows that you see across as the language of niches in the older Mahabodhi temples. The highly cobbled structure with the horns. This is a water body that separates the guest block from the public blocks. That's the public block with its courtyard with the cafe on one side. So very simple language of actually using the vernacular but contemporizing it only to the level that uh, it needs to for a project like this. The next one that I'll um, touch base is on uh, you know crafting concrete. Uh, um, being a, a, a country where skill of carpentry is available but this is the most challenging thing that we've faced ever since we've been using form finished concrete in our projects is how do you get that lovely concrete that Ando does? You know, what, what is required for it? Is it the carpentry that you need to really hone in on? Because it's not the action of the pouring of... Size, but concrete, because it is the art of how carpentry works, uh, can never be something which is absolutely flat and finished. So this is a project in Alibang that we had done roughly about 10 years ago. Um, it is called the Leaf House. I'm again going to focus only on what the leaves do and how did we make this happen. It's um, uh, the, 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 the site had a lot of mango trees and coconut trees and the uh, house was kind of formulated around the idea of pods. Um, and each pod was a leaf. Uh, so what you see here in this plan is you have the living pods with the den and then you have the bedroom pods. Um, we ebbed and swelled the heights of it depending on the way uh, you had to protect it from the southwest rains of Aliba, which is pretty torrential. And then how do you make drawings? This is at a time which was almost about 10 to 12 years ago where Aliba did not have uh, major contracting teams that could do concrete of the level that we were expecting. But of course, we worked and collaborated with one team uh, who was who had the passion for it um, and sailed along with us. And what you see over here is we were trying to emulate the uh, wounds of the leaf while we were designing the lines of the shuttering and the structure. Um, and uh, what you see is to make this happen, everything is absolutely local. This is not at a time when we could get double scaffolding metal uh, 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 parangis that you now use. Uh, it's being used with simple uh, local jackwood um, and mango wood uh, um, um, framework 
uh, and casuarina props. So there's no metal props as well. Today, when we actually do our flat slabs, without a metal prop, we will not kind of accept any shuttering happening on any site because the levels and the precisions in a flat slab is so important. Here, we did not have much to lose because of course it is a curve and casuarina props could do it equally well. Um, so you see how this entire skeletal structure works and it's all carpentered and what, uh, when you see a concrete roof of this nature, it's not just the concrete, but it's actually the surface on which the concrete falls. This is a film coated marine ply, uh, which has, a, 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 you know, in today's day and age, we could use a chemical from Fosrock to make it as a beautiful debonding agent so that when your ply gets off, you do not see surface blemishes on the concrete. That's a very important aspect at that time. Diesel was one of the ways to kind of use it. Um, and technology has changed. Now there are many, many different ways of doing this. Um, casting it to that precision, both on the top and the bottom. And again, similarly to what you saw in the Lotus Cafe, there's nothing that goes on top of it other than a waterproofing uh, um, a layer. And the waterproofing layer is not like a brick backed Koba layer. Uh, because it's already sloping, you do not need the brick back for creating the slopes, but you need something which is waterproof and does not kind of leak. It's it's in Alibag in the uh, in the midst of heavy monsoons, and this is the end product that you see after you kind of go through this entire exercise, where you do see the lines, you do see the blemishes, you do see the uh, uh, shuttering, uh, and the joints that kind of have uh, various different. Uh, 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 you know, thicknesses to it, but all this depends on how well are your two surfaces meeting while you're actually casting the concrete. Um, and fairly, we were able to get a pretty, pretty decent uh, job on this and some more pictures just to show how the space completely functions. This is the living space, which is not uh, uh, closed at all, no doors, uh, nothing. It doesn't get enclosed. It's completely uh, open on the sides with a garden on one side while the swimming pool on the other side. That's the pool reflecting and refracting light onto the underside of this roof. Um, that's where it's sitting in the context. And you can see even the top of the roof, because it had to be done so precisely, not just at the bottom. At the bottom, you had the skin or the uh, shuttering to really give you the shape and the form. On the top, it had to be the human hand and the human skill to actually take an aluminum runner and run across it to really get this finish. Um, that's the courtyard that gets formed in between, just sharing a few more pictures. Um, sharing one more project in the same uh, arena, which is 10 years later on how now we're able to do concrete a little better. Um, this is a building in Chennai. We handed it over last year. It's a residential building, uh, which has about four duplay. It has a four on the atrium. It becomes a community space. Unlike buildings which are now dividing their cores and you know neighbors don't get to see each other, here the core is a welcome space for neighbors to kind of meet in the community. And what you see the score is completely It's a it's a six story high building, so you see that entire thing is a tall retaining RCC wall, uh, off of which the entire structure takes in. And that was a huge challenge because again, all the challenges that I spoke about on how carpentered uh, shuttering actually enables a good concrete. And you can see as you start at the bottom, you will get great finishes. As you reach on the top, uh, your, your finishes may start getting a little diluted because by then the team is starting to face the challenges of the height, uh, many other challenges as you go further. So concrete on the whole uh, is something which is a skill that we haven't really uh, mastered. I would say when I say we, I would say as a community of architects in the country because a lot of concrete also gets rendered. Um, and it doesn't get left raw, while what you see here is the raw concrete as uh, it is. Um, so that's what the core is, that's the core of the concrete. And what you see over here is now we are starting to accept our tie rods, like the way Ando does it. We are leaving them and kind of, you know, if they, if they 
created some blemishes somewhere, we are kind of accepting them and leaving them, but we wouldn't render any of this concrete. Um, that core also forms a completely uh, ventilated or a naturally ventilated, mechanically full convection ventilated core. It's a non-air conditioned space while the rest of the building is completely air conditioned. Um, that's the way you see how the core behaves with the right hand side being the complete retaining wall off of which the structure uh, spans. Uh, these are some of the construction pictures of this. Um, I'm showing this in particular to actually focus on how the shuttering really works. What I want to just focus on over here is this sketch. So as you keep casting them in ply shuttering sizes of eight by four, uh, we do leave wedges so that by the time the next one does, uh, it is dovetailing into the first one so that you don't have the blemishes of the slurry leaking from that part. The shuttering becomes a really important aspect of how you really work with this in terms of, you know, this whole double skin, the bracing of the concrete uh, uh, wall. Bracing is such an important aspect because you are vibrating the concrete and you have this entire structure in ply. Uh, and while you're vibrating the concrete, the entire structure needs to be firm. Uh, you don't want waves in the wall and the bracing becomes an important aspect. And that's what you see the end product. You do see some colors of the marine coated ply actually leave them. Over time, it goes away. Uh, and these are non-rendered at all. So what you see over here is the non-rendered concrete. Some more pictures of this well. Yeah, and the last project that I'm going to share is uh, where craft is actually used using craft. This is a site in Alibag. It is a 100 bedded hospital in Alibag. Uh, the site that came to us, it is for JSW Foundation, the site that came to us, which uh, was a completely slag filled site, unlike it's at the fringe of pain and Alibag. Uh, unlike the uh, rest of Alibag, which is absolutely green, this site was completely barren and arid. And the aspect of uh, building here was really to nurture through nature and to heal through craft. Uh, and that's what we have tried to do. This is sitting in the context of a steel plant very close by. Uh, the building is built simply with RCC and steel because we had the availability of the materials right within a kilometer of our site. Um, and uh, uh, what I'm gonna focus on in this building is a very simple building is all the crafted nature of how uh, craft played an important role. So what you see over here is as soon as you enter into the hospital building, you won't see a waiting space. You actually see a space which is meant for introspection and reflection. There's this wall with a lot of bells, which are copper bells. These are produced in touch with the copper metal workers um, and craftspeople. And uh, uh, you see just this Ashtavinayak wall. That's, that's, that's the way in... Uh, which people wanted to kind of connect to the divine. Uh, what you see is a lot of Gond artwork. The reason we chose Gond was because Gond plays beautifully with nature, interprets nature in a beautiful manner. And what you see over here is large artworks. Gond is usually done in smaller formats, but these were done on a larger format. Uh, we uh, took help of Baya and they became our mediators and facilitators to actually uh, uh, you know, interpret our um, narrative to the craftspeople, convert it into what we needed these to do. Um, so that's that's the level and the scale of craft. And when you go into a hospital of this nature and you're waiting there at this administration counter, uh, these are just moments of relief. These are just moments of hope that you actually get in a hospital. Um, that's, you know, it's a very open hospital, lots of seating spaces, unlike any other urban hospital, it's completely connected to nature on the outside, the landscape has now started to grow, we handed this over through COVID, um, uh, one and a half years ago, uh, a lot of color, a lot of ways in which craft has been integrated, this is the main waiting area for the OPD, and what we've done is we've actually used um, these moving birds suspended and again gone there's a craft uh, medium was used so when you see the winds blowing on the on the on the side behind is the west and this entire tunnel is an east west tunnel which is completely forming the wind channel and you are in this zone where it's always ventilated there are no kind of you don't need to use the fans on and you see these little birds kind of moving around while you're in this waiting space 
Um, lots of other expressions of how Gond as an artwork has been used, using stories from mythology, um, using stories from how nature is woven through the Gond artworks. Uh, this is on the first floor. Using stories from the hospital is called the JSW Sanjeevni Hospital. So it was important for us to get one of the Sanjeevni stories of Hanuman. And this is again one of the walls with the Kalamkari artwork. That's the scale of the wall. Um, you can see how the detail of the artwork works and the colors and the relief that it actually offers. Uh, that's it on, uh, on, on my set. I want to close this one with a Peter Zumta project, which is something that I have watched and loved and how this little chapel that he has done, which is called the Bruder Kloss Chapel in Germany, uh, renders to another dimension when um, a violinist actually uses Bach's uh, piece within this space. So I, I just love everybody to kind of see this. Uh, it's very touching, it's very moving. It's the power of craft, it's the power of materiality, it's the power of space, sound, and acoustics, and lighting that really plays beautifully. Lovely, um, Sarika. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive uh, presentation about. I mean, yeah. Going since going I was just taking time. Sorry. <laughs> for going overboard on time, I think. No, no, it's okay. We'll we'll keep our uh, questions as as tight as possible. But uh, I must say that uh, you know while you're going through, I was just making so many notes down and um, just making very trying to make very astute call up, uh, observations about um, you know about your process you know, even as a firm, you know, that you're not just, um, craft is not an accent to you, right? It is, it is part of, intrinsic. Uh, of your intrinsic design from the get-go. I just wanted to, I, I, I mean, I'm curious about, you know, what do you think about, um, I mean, is it possible and sustainable in the long run, right? Because um, the projects that you shared, 
they are very exclusive and they are very um, you know they, they they are very specific to a particular context and culture right i'm just wondering uh, and and if it's possible to think about this right is is it possible at all for your process to be um, integral right from from the get go is it possible for craft to not just be paid attention to as a detail but as part of a process right especially in the indian context given the fact that you know our cities are growing our um, our population is going in numbers and uh, you know there is always that need to quickly turn around projects so just wondering um, um, you know what what is your thought on this you know how do we take craft away from just being a detail and let it be integral to the architecture process this is a interesting question because you know you uh, uh, the way we kind of start these projects is there's a huge amount of narrative that goes through you know right from uh, uh, so let's say a cultural context like a tirupati or a bodh gaya it yeah. takes the first three days of ever going on that site and literally uh, uh, kind of uh, you know embracing that culture and really observing it very carefully and observation really helps because the whole idea of dashavtar came yeah. because it's strewn across this entire path that you walk to tirupati on the top there's a there's a walking track called uh, the alipri uh, which is a 14 kilometers walk at an altitude of uh, um, you know where the tirumala is and you yeah. see it's strewn and from a heritage point of view india in terms of what it had in terms of its culture in terms of architecture uh, is something that uh, uh, is so beautiful so powerful that just simply proportions is something that is the most important thing you know the way light falls into a space when you enter into a space what's that vibe that you get uh, it's all to do with the proportion scale and the light and that's what we strive to now craft in its real sense one is how you craft it and one is the intrinsic way of uh, crafting spaces itself is all about the proportions of how you bring in all these elements uh, so so i think it's uh, yeah these are niche projects this is the way the practice really uh, works it is the usp of the project uh, of the uh, practice but of course the practice also does a lot of other projects which needs Uh, uh you know and these are all in budget so let me tell you tirupati actually started off um, as a brief for a three star with the client just giving a brief for a three star there was no brand narrative at all the brand narrative was created through the storytelling this is not a narrative that the client asked for this was the outcome of all our research and studies that we did through the context and the culture and what you get at the end is a product which costed them in the range of a three star but what they are able to pitch it as is a uh, is a affiliated five star um so that's also where a lot of our energy and time goes because when it comes to customization of all these details they don't come at a price that you can pay uh, uh, over the top we we value engineer every single aspect to reach that lotus cafe to the detail that we have required huge amount of value engineering you know why did you we use corrugated sheets there and leave it as it is because that was the most uh, economical way and efficient way of doing it and that could have kind of you know that became a uh, why corrugated why not any other sheet because it reinforced well with the 50 mm spread concrete so uh, at the end all of this even when you uh, come to talking about cost there is a nature in which you're crafting that cost and to make your uh, space work you are really back working a lot on cost and value engineering things as well so i think bottom line for me it would be for anybody to walk into a space and really feel that connect or the move if a space moves you it means it's done it whether it's through the light or whether it's the form or whether it's the special sizes of it yeah absolutely because um, you know uh, it was interesting to see a lot of our uh, viewers our uh, audience members also commenting and and i'm uh, and i echo this one person who mentioned the uh, Uh, I think Somya was the one who mentioned that she felt uh, she feels intimidated by this kind of thought process and detailing, but it's still so inspiring. Um, I I was also curious uh, because you mentioned that you know there is of course you mentioned value engineering and um, you know how you need to engineer craft you know in certain ways. So can you maybe talk about that process a little more, right? How do you kind of um, create that al- am- amalgam between design function? um you know between um and and also considering climate conditions weather weather conditions 
what are the what are those benchmarks that you put in place when you try to create an effective amalgam amalgam between everything and include engineering as part of this too so just to again give this through the example of the nirvana shutters yeah um, that was something completely innovative something that we had never done uh, the team we were co uh, collaborating with stonarts had never done right uh, and i think it was just the belief and the passion that the two teams had um, that kind of helped us take it through of course it required a lot of research it required a lot of trial and error and it required a client who could believe that you could do this um at the end of that handover we actually produced a manual for the clients to give them the instructions on how to maintain a building like this at the end they did not need it because you know things did work uh, details did last and uh, uh, that's because of the amount of trial and error in the mock ups that we did uh, so engineering plays a very important role because when it comes to even simple hardware how do you open that entire set of shutters collectively um, now it's done very often i see in many other projects but when this was done 12 years ago it was something which was not done and we were working with a material that we did not know if we screwed it in it cracked or where and how do you screw it in which means that every single screw that went on the surface of it had to have a strengthening band at the back now who was doing the screw fixing was a different team in bangalore and who was making the shutters was a different team in bombay and all that coordination had to be done through mock ups to make sure that that scissor mechanism of a handle that connects together where does it get screwed and it doesn't miss its it goes into a hollow patch it's gone it's going to kind of lose its uh, strength and completely fall off um and all of this is possible i think only with uh, uh the experience of the team that you're working with the willingness of the team that you're working with because maybe not always experience is there uh, yeah. we are all kind of uh, using each other's uh, experience and expertise to really make that happen and it is a huge collaboration i don't think anything works without a collaborative process being a uh, a uh, 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 project is as successful as uh, the collaborations you know it has made in the process so uh, yeah and the need and the function is the first thing that you have to finally meet with so all of that has to kind of keep ticking the boxes to make sure that it's efficient it's sustainable it's functional uh, these shutters in solid acrylic surface if i want to kind of recycle it it can go back to the factory get completely recycled uh, so that's that's the kind of material it is right right uh, i'm just going to uh, request rutra if you can please um, uh, make the poll to live because it'll be really interesting to see um you know if there has been any kind of um, um you know i mean we would love to know what our audience thinks um you know how important it is to integrate craft into the architecture process and also the fact that whether their viewpoints have changed at all after this presentation because you know from what what you've explained also earlier about you know how it's not just about detail it is about integration and collaboration and speaking of collaboration can you just maybe enlighten us about um how you of course uh, because see collaboration is easier said than done right it is also about again um, you know uh, it is also about context and it's also about finding the right skill like for instance um, you know for you to share that you know you have to find one team for one aspect of the project and another team to just kind of fit in the screw in that particular shutter i and i think that that requires more than just skill and expertise right so how do you how do you uh, uh, figure out the right collaboration collaborative processes for it and um, where are you willing to compromise if that is a question at all it's a very interesting question so you know we realized this uh, over time a lot of our projects don't end up being in bombay they are all across the country right and that makes it uh, more difficult on why our drawings need to speak what it needs to speak and simplify it we play yeah. a lot with our physical models Yeah. Uh, our physical models are from the scale of one is two hundred to a detail of one is to twenty five as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that becomes engaging for us. Design workshops, not just with our consultants, but even with our site teams, play a very important role. And through those design workshops, of course, with the consultants, those are 
uh, you know, parallel professionals who know how to go about it. And design workshops are something which is very critical to our process. It's very iterative, but we do design workshops even with the site team. So ever uh, 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 since, uh, uh, you, you know, this whole power of model making, even though there are renders and even though there are 3D models, we still are very biased towards our physical models and we love to keep them at the scale that we'd love to explore so that we are able to kind of take them to the site. Often our site teams request us to leave it with them. Uh, that's, that's something uh, we really kind of uh, 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 end up doing also because then it just helps them understand the project so much more better. Um, and the first meeting that you actually engage with to tell the client team or the site team what the crux of the project is before they actually start seeing the working drawings and start building. If you start bringing them to power of this engagement and bring them to terms on what you really want to achieve through this process, I think everybody is happy to collaborate and give their inputs right at the start. Uh, our problem starts happening when things don't happen the way you have envisaged it and then force correction of all of that, which happens all the time uh, because uh, uh, not everybody's understood everything clearly or the person who's supposed to explain it to the end doer is not done that and hence the end doer doesn't know exactly how does that joinery injunction need to meet. Um, so it's, it's completely to do with the aspect of communication, how you're communicating through your drawings, through your models, through these design workshops. Um, and now of course, WhatsApp is there with hundred groups for the same project that, uh, you know, communication has become both a bane and a boon. Uh, so, WhatsApp indeed, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah I would say, collaboration and communication are uh, very critical to be able to sail together to get what you want. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. I think we can make the uh, poll live now, Rudra. If you can please share the results of the poll. So we asked everyone, do you think it is important to integrate craft uh, uh, into our, the architecture process? And yeah, it's lovely to see that there's a majority that believes that, uh, that it is essential to revive lost arts and extend traditional processes. Uh, which I think again has been one of the uh, one of the foundational principles of your firm too, right? And and it and it essays so well into your projects too. We do have a lot of project questions also coming in, uh, um, Sarika. Maybe I can um, just get you to answer some of them because some of them are uh, essentially related to material. Uh, I think um, um, yeah, there was Anusha who and a few others also had asked about the Nirvana office that you talked about. Um, uh, uh, with respect to the Nirvana office, uh, what about things like, uh, you know, covering the facade with mosquito? I mean, is, is mosquito infestation of pigeons? Is, um, how do you tackle that with the facade that you created, if, if that was a um, issue at all? That's a very good question. In Nirvana, we did not need to, neither have they 12 years down the line done anything to do with mosquito uh, netting. Uh, okay. It is, uh, but in boat club apartments, uh, yeah. which was one of the other projects that you saw, uh, the brief was Chennai is infested with mosquitoes and the building needs to be air conditioned. And uh, for us, uh, we were very clear that even though we are giving these uh, apartment uh, uh, due play, as due play, uh, air conditioning is kind of secondary, but you will get the cross ventilation, you will get the uh, uh, mosquito netting and what, what we then end up doing is we have a similar format of, uh, you know, need based issues that that site had to face, and we have these louvers. Um, and with the louvers, we also have a sliding set of mosquito meshes so they are they are they're so discreetly done that they actually go and get hidden within the wooden frames. So when they are open, you don't end up seeing it because the mesh is so fine. And when they are closed, they go and rest against uh, uh, the wooden framework. So yes, mosquito netting is a very important thing. Uh, when you are in a context that has mosquitoes as an issue that becomes the second layer and you must provide for it. And you have to start thinking about your facade right from the start that there is a double skin, there's a second layer and how are you going to integrate both those layers together? Fortunately, Nirvana did not need it. Uh, and we're very happy that it did not need it at that time, neither did it need it today. Uh, maybe the context around is uh, 
uh, self-sustaining the biodiversity that it's not needing it. Uh, but, but I'm sure they, they work late nights. So they are there at that time when mosquitoes really kind of, uh, you know, uh, trouble us. Um, and uh, uh, I'm not sure whether they kind of shut it at those uh, hours or what, but we've never got this complaint. And they're an office that works uh, works through the night as well. Right, right. So that's really interesting because, um, 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 you know, uh, that's one of the major concerns, right? And, and even in terms of the facade, it is, it's, it's so... Uh, it's so refreshing to see that because I, I can't imagine that kind of a facade, let's say, in a city like Bombay, especially near the coast, right? It's, it's very tricky to maybe execute that, right? So, so it's very interesting for you to share that with us. Um, Aditi uh, Gautama is asking about the uh, hotel in Bodhgaya. She was asking about why, what is the reason behind the layers that you've created for the roof? Um, um, the, uh, you were talking about the four layers of tiles. Um, is there a specific reason why um, uh, four layers and was that to do primarily with the climate conditions or was it was there something more to that? So there are two reasons. One is, of course, the added insulation that every layer adds with it. Um, the second is when you see the entire structure and the scale of it. Uh, typically, country tiles always, they do this. And you need at least two layers. So which means it's a pair. So means minimum four happens only. Um, the reason to do almost six of it, which is three pairs, is so that you can break the scale and the scale and the proportion of the country tiles edging at that cobbled edge was very important and it looked disproportionate if it was only uh, uh, two twin layers. And uh, every layer did add a huge amount of insulation because the form of it, which is a tapered uh, 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 the country tiles are tapered. That's the reason how they interlock into each other. Uh, mm -hmm. They also create air gaps in between. So they, it's not just the function of terracotta, but it's also the air gaps that gets created. And then on the layer that it sits in, there are two double batons. So the two baton layers go like that. So suppose if ever all the six layers of country tiles break because there is, uh, I don't know, a hailstorm or something that happens on top of it, your water will still never go down because there is a layer at the bottom that will let the water completely go out through and through. Um, yeah, so the the the, uh, the layer was both for insulation and to break the visual scale. Right. Um, no, that's that's really interesting. Again, uh, that's an example of uh, value engineering with craft, right? You're you're just using a simple process to uh, and and you're using natural materials. I mean. Um, you know, without having to uh, use any add-on layer of technology or anything else, yeah, exactly. yeah. which is which is so which is so interesting to see. Uh, I think um, I, yeah, we are aware of the uh, of of the time, so I'll just uh, quickly wrap up with the last round of questions. Um, uh, there was another interesting question by Makran. He was asking about uh, yes, you you while you do work uh, very closely with artisan communities, um, um, you know, especially for the Bodh Gaya project, and you talked about you know working with artisan in Andhra Pradesh, how is that relationship uh, working? And do you, do you have any financial aids or, um, you know, government policies or anything of that sort where you support these uh, craftspeople in any way? Or if you can just generally talk about um, how your firm actually goes about doing that? So supporting really, these artisan uh, communities? Yeah. So um, when it came to Bodh Gaya, the, uh, the impact and the uh, pay was directly to the artisans, uh, which means that uh, uh, our team identified these Potter families. The Potter families identified various other Potter families and created the numbers because the numbers had to be produced within a stipulated time. And yeah. to produce that, they had to actually seek help from many other Potter families. Now that payment went directly from the client to the artisan. So there was no middlemen uh, you know, kind of in that process at all. So they were empowered uh, directly through the resource. Um, these are private projects, so there's no government funding of any sort in this kind of a project. It's it's a hotel which has been put together by a private uh, owner um, and operated by an Indian operator. Um, so uh, that's that's on Bodh Gaya. Uh, um, if I speak about the JSW artworks and the artworks uh, at Tirupati using Dokra, um, we uh, did again work with uh, Baya at Tirupati for Dokra as well. And a lot of the Dokra there 
was from stretches it was spread because we had a lot of handles across all spaces had handles to that scale and engineered to that level um, so it was done with artisans uh, right from belts of uh, Andhra and Odisha uh, and till Chandrapur. So this entire area is actually supposedly the Naxal belt. That's because the tribals are there. And that's where the Dokra craft actually ranges from Chandrapur and Maharashtra to Odisha to Andhra. So that's the range of uh, uh, artisans and Baya really uh, facilitated all of this um, and they were the ones identifying the artisans um, and I think from a perspective of uh, 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 business communication and employment, Bayer knows what their role is because they are a craft-based company and they are the ones who kind of facilitate it. So they are the ones who we engage with or the clients engage with and they are the ones finally facilitating this entire process with the end user or end artisan. Okay. That's the same for the Gond artworks because that scale right. and size was, so Gond is usually done on paper, uh, even if it is the smaller sizes because all across the hospital uh, rooms within all the IPD rooms, maternity, consultancies, they are all smaller frames. So those are very easy, they're typical, like how you would see Gond artworks. But these large frames that you see in public spaces, they were not done on paper, they were done on uh, uh, sunboard and these are all jigsaw pieces that actually came together. So tomorrow, if something happens and it needs mending, I don't need to repaint the wall or the wall. It's not painted on the wall. So I can kind of remove it. I can remove that piece, either send it to the artisan, get it done, and then kind of re shut it. So the modularity of that entire scale was also really well thought. So that's like the engineering of how you modularity, you know, work with the modularity of those large scales. No, that's amazing. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sarika, for, for sharing that. Uh, I know that there are a lot of questions. I'm, I'm just uh, sifting through the chat once, but we are very mindful of time. And uh, I know that it's a Friday evening. Too, so do not want to derail anyone's plans for sure. Uh, but this has been really informative, um, Sarika. Thank you so much uh, for your time and for such an insightful presentation. I'm sure there's been a lot of learning and a lot of uh, uh, interesting ideas also that have been uh, that uh, everyone can take uh, take away today. Um, there will be a feedback form that will be shared uh, on the group, everyone. So if you can please share your feedback about today's session and also leave your suggestions about who you'd like to uh, see in the next uh, masterclass, we would love to hear from you. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, um, uh, we, we will need to close this session out today. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Sarika, for your time and uh, for such a lovely presentation and a lovely one. Thank you, Sneha, Mrinalini, Sham, everyone at GVCC and the patient audience because I think it's more longer than your usual. It was so worth it. No, thank every, you for your yeah. patience. Yeah, especially the pro the projects. Uh, uh, I personally love the hospital uh, and the way that uh, it was planned and the way that, um, you know, even the artworks were so seamless with, um, you know, um, uh, seamlessly integrated within the spaces. Because a hospital space needs to be warm. It needs to be inviting. It, it cannot be a space that, um, you know, is is full of dread, which we're so used to in metropolitan cities. So this, is, this was really lovely. Um, but yeah, um, thanks everybody for, for your time and we hope to see you very soon for the next PC Live. You will get to hopefully uh, know the details very soon. Uh, but yes, please spend five minutes. Uh, it'll take, in fact, less than five minutes for you to fill in the feedback form. We would love to hear from you. We do take feedback very seriously. Uh, and, um, and yeah, um, we, we would love to know who you'd like to see next. And, uh, and yeah, um, thank you so much, everyone. And have a lovely day. And a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Happy weekend, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.